Order, order. We start with questions. The Secretary of State for Justice, Chris Evans. Number one, Mr. Speaker. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Probation professionals perform a critical and invaluable role for our society. We are injecting an additional £155 million a year to recruit more staff, reduce caseloads and continue to deliver better community supervision of offenders. We are seeing improvements in performance as that investment beds in, but there is more to do and I continue to monitor closely. Chris Evans. I thank the Minister for that answer, but he will know G uh, NAPO, GMB and Unison have all say that the probation service is facing soaring workloads. Employees are buckling under the pressure. There are high sickness rates. With many workers off sick, this is going to have a massive impact on public safety. Something has to be done. Therefore, stepping outside the politics of this, will he commit to work constructively with unions and other agencies to bring about a strategy which will address this critical area of probation? Yeah. Yeah. Grateful to the honourable gentleman, who I know takes a very close interest in these matters, <laughs> and rightly so. And I absolutely <laughs> commit to working uh, in partnership. Uh, with unions and other representative bodies and others to make sure that we do have the right support for this service. I do want to reassure him, though, that recruitment to the probation service has been very encouraging over the last three years, and we have managed to uh, just exceed our stretching recruitment targets. Can I welcome the Shadow Minister, Ruth Capley? Yeah. 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 Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, in July, the Inspectorate of Probation reported that they had found that far too many potential victims of domestic violence are at risk from those on probation due to wide-ranging systemic failures in the service. Furthermore, the Chief Inspector uh, of the Probation Service said things have deteriorated since their 2018 report into the Probation Service. Isn't the Minister concerned that once again, after 13 years of Conservative rule, things are continuing to get worse for victims of domestic violence? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, Mr Speaker, first, may I join you in welcoming the Honourable Lady uh, to her place, and I look forward to working uh, constructively together with her. She raises the a very important uh, uh, point about protection of people from domestic abuse, uh, from those who are on probation. And I do want to reassure her that we have put in place further uh, measures and indeed invested additional money, uh, uh, £1.5 million pounds a year, uh, to support those extra address checks going into where, uh, where offenders may be going to make sure that, the, that there is not that domestic abuse risk. Cheryl Murray. I'm too pleased, Mr Speaker. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And we continue to develop opportunities for work and training both during custody and upon release. And I'm pleased to say that the proportion of prison leavers employed six months after release has increased markedly over the last two years. Thank you, Mr Speaker. What help can the Department give to aid the mobility of this potential workforce and get them to where they need to be? Well, my honourable friend raises an important point, and going to where those job opportunities are is incredibly important. I would venture to opportunities like through the, uh, through the DWP, the Job Centre Plus uh, rail card, but also we need to make sure that uh, prisoners are put in touch at the point of release to opportunities near to where they, where they live, where they're going to. So one of the reasons why there's a particular value, although we work with employers large and small, but there's a particular value on working with multi-site firms who have locations in, in many different places. And this water. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. There have been seven deaths in Wormwood Scrubs Prison as a result of self harm in the past three years. The first of the inquests into those deaths, that of Luke Clark, was only concluded last month. It found inadequate care, fear, and confusion contributed to Luke's death. What is the Ministry of Justice doing to prevent the unacceptable level of self inflicted and avoidable deaths in prison? And what is it doing to speed up the inquest process? I'm still waiting for the, meet the meeting I was promised by the member Finchley and Golders Green into the inquest process on the 27th of June. Minister. Mr. Speaker, I, I, this is a very important point. Obviously, we were talking about employment uh, upon, re upon release, but this, what the Honourable Gentleman raised is incredibly important. I've visited Wormwood uh, Scrubs myself. Uh, uh, rates of self-harm are unacceptably high. They vary by place. Of course, in the women's estate, we have a particular issue uh, with self-harm. We're working very closely with the, with the National Health Service, uh, who, of course, provide mental health support in prisons. And I'm absolutely determined that we bring, we bring levels of self-harm down. I now come to and welcome Shadow Minister Janet Davey. Yeah. 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 Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. 
Prison leavers in employment training are less likely to re-offend. This means education and training for young offenders in prison is crucial. So can the uh, Secretary say why the government so far has failed to implement a new prison education service? In 2019, this was promised in their party's manifesto. Implementing it in 2025 is too little, too late. Um, well, uh, Mr. Speaker, again, may I, may I join you in welcoming uh, the, the Honourable Lady to her, to her place and similarly look forward to working with her. I can bring her good news. I mean, first of all, of course, there is an education service in prisons and operates in, in every prison with four, contracted, four contracted providers. Uh, we also have additional provision that governors uh, can put in place, but for the new service that she refers to, and it was indeed a manifesto commitment. That process is, is, well, is well underway, and I'm looking forward to being able to make further announcements uh, before long. John Graff. Number three, Mr Speaker. Thank you very much. Um, Mr Speaker, with your permission, I'll group questions 3, 10 and 12. The crimes associated with Vorg are abhorrent which is why we have already taken significant action to strengthen the criminal justice system's response to it, including, for example, through our end-to-end -end rape review driving up prosecutions and the introduction of new protections for victims through the landmark Domestic Abuse Act. Much has been done, but we are ambitious to go further. John Cryer. Th thank you, Mr Speaker. I understand what the Minister is saying, but nevertheless, it's taking two years or more for rape victims to come to court and 69 per cent of those victims withdraw from their cases before they come to trial. So has the Minister had the chance to look at our proposal for specialist rape courts in every Crown Court in the country? Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'm grateful to the Honourable Gentleman. If I may slightly crave your indulgence, may I take this opportunity, it's the first time at the um, box, to pay tribute to the Honourable Lady, the Member for Cardiff North, who shadowed me for some time and the Honourable Lady, the Member for Lewisham West and Penge, who did as well. Um, I wish them both well, though, given the latter's election coordination role, hopefully not too well in that role. Um, to the Honourable Gentleman's um, question, um, it remains our priority to deliver swifter access to justice for victims of rape, and as he alludes to, for victims of rape, the experience of attending court will be incredibly difficult. That's why we have committed to increase the number of ISVAs and IDVAs to over 1,000 over the next three years. And in June 2022, we announced our ambitious specialist sexual violence support project in three Crown Courts aimed at improving facilities and technology. To his um, specific question, um, I would urge a degree of caution on those proposals for a number of reasons. One, of course, listing is a judicial prerogative, but also it's important we retain flexibility within the use of the court estate to maximise the use of courts and judges' times for a range of offences and to meet the needs of those courts. Abraham. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The independent inquiry into child sexual abuse recognised the issues with the criminal justice system, saying the length of time to investigate and prosecute CSA cases is a matter of significant concern. Delays within the criminal justice system adds to the harm caused by the abuse itself. The experience of a constituent time helping suggests this is still the case. So what mandatory training for court, ju uh, judicial and other criminal justice staff uh, are, are, is available on this to ensure that they appropriately support people who have been subject to this abuse? Well, I'm grateful to the Honourable Lady. It's nice to see her in her place. Always a pleasure to answer questions from her. Um, and she highlights a very important issue around um, ICSA and historic and indeed current child sexual abuse. It is worth remembering that the investigation of these time crimes can be lengthy because of the complexities of the crimes and the obtaining of evidence. While training for the judiciary and courts is a matter for the judiciary and the judicial college rather than for His Majesty's Government, we have been investing in training and police forces have been investing in training across a range of specialisms, including um, handling child sexual abuse cases. It's important that they are handled with sensitivity and with an understanding of the impact that the trauma has had on those who are victims and indeed also witnesses. If she mentioned, she did highlight there, I touch on a specific case, I'm very happy to engage with her out with the Chamber if that's helpful to her on that particular point. Jones. Thank you, Mr. 
Mr Speaker, um, according to the latest research, rape charges are taking longer to be brought forward, with the average time a victim has to wait for their attacker to be charged, just charged, now taking more than 400 days. That's yeah. over a year. This is disgraceful and the situation is getting worse. So when will ministers speed up the process and give women, girls and all victims of rape across England and Wales the justice they deserve? Yeah. 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 I'm grateful to the Honourable Lady. She's right to highlight the importance of um, timeliness. One of the key aims of Operation Soteria, which is the uh, new model for investigating rape and serious sexual offences, is being rolled out to all police forces in the coming months. One of its aims is to improve timeliness. Investigations in this space are of necessity often complex and can take a long time. However, what I would say to her is that the number of rape convictions is at or around the level it was in 2010. Now, the number of cases passed by the police, the CPS, for charge is up 130 per cent. The number of cases charged is up more than 90 per cent. And the number of cases received in the Crown Court is up more than 120 per cent. Much has been achieved, but she's right to highlight there is always more we can and should do in this important space. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. When it comes to tackling violence against women and girls, uh, we need a criminal justice system that works, and part of that is to have the laws that are up to date to deal with the issues that women are facing today. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with my right honourable friend, the Minister, on amendments to the online safety bill, which will make it a, a criminal offence to post Im intimate images online without consent. But he knows, I know, and others know that it's still there are still gaps in the law when it comes to the making of those images. Will he give us an indication today when the government is intending to bring forward further legislation, not only to deal with that, but to keep online safety under constant review? Thank you, Mr Speaker. Well, I'm grateful to my right honourable friend, and it's been a pleasure to have worked with her on those amendments to the Online Safety Bill, which returns to us in this place uh, today. And she's also right to highlight the rapidly changing environment which we are legislating for and the need, therefore, to keep things under constant review. While she tempts me, I, I may resist the temptation to speculate on a forthcoming King's speech or any future legislative announcements. What I would say to her, which I hope gives her some reassurance, is we have been clear that as soon as um, legislative time can be found, the government is committed to implementing the full package of measures in the, um, uh, in the Law Commission report. Question number four, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, the most recent annual prison performance ratings uh, for 22-23 were published in July. HMP YOI New Hall was rated a 2, which is a matter of concern. HMP Wakefield was rated a 4 or outstanding. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Inspectorate of Prisons inspected HMP Wakefield last year. They had several concerns, including many that remained unaddressed since their last visit. This included infrastructure in such a poor condition it needed investment, insufficient healthcare staff, lack of mental health interventions and too few activity places. The prison leadership and staff continue to do the right thing and should be praised. But when will the minister play his part and get our prisons back on track? Amen. Mr Speaker, thank you. And I'm grateful to the honourable gentleman. He's right to talk about the inspectorate reports of prisoners, which are very, prisons which are a very, very important part of our system. They help to hold the prison service and us uh, to account. In the case of Wakefield, as, as he mentions, um, it was judged uh, three, which is reasonably good for safety and for respect and rehabilitation and release planning. There was more to do on purposeful activity, and that is a theme that we have seen in a number of reports I readily uh, accept from different prisons over time, particularly since COVID. Um, the inspector also uh, mentioned uh, the strong leadership uh, at, at the prison and that the prison was settled and we need to continue to make progress. And I join him in paying tribute to the leadership at that prison and throughout our prison service and all the brilliant staff who make it what it is. Yeah. Mr. Alders. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Number five. Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, my own friend raised an important point and we do remain committed to working with our partners across the criminal justice system to try and ensure that the court processes are as efficient as possible. Alongside that, we have introduced a raft of measures to achieve that aim, including allowing courts to sit for an unlimited number of sitting days for the third year in a row. We've extended the use of 24 Nightingale courtrooms, 
and in addition to that opened two permanent super courtrooms in Manchester and Loughborough and we're recruiting an additional 1,000 judges across all jurisdictions. Geraldus. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. I'm grateful to my honourable friend for that reply. In Suffolk, the backlog of criminal court cases remains stubbornly high. Not only is this denying victims justice, but it's placing a huge burden on the police and it's costing the local taxpayer a fortune. Working with Suffolk Police and Crime Commissioner Tim Passmore, can my honourable friend produce a comprehensive and bespoke plan that first clears the backlog and that sense then sets out a long-term strategy for the efficient functioning of the courts in the county. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I, I can reassure my honourable friend that in Suffolk, the disposals to March 2023 were up by 23% on the previous quarter, whilst the outstanding caseload slightly reduced in the same period. And that does reflect the hard work that is done across uh, with our partners to ensure uh, that we get through the case as fast as possible. And we are continuing to work with the judiciary to identify how we can continue to get the high workload uh, moving more smoothly. Uh, across um, the department, working with our partners, the Crown Court Improvement Group continues to look at best practice and the Local Criminal Justice Board will always look at best practice across the country to see what we can do to ensure that his area continues to perform. Mr Speaker, is the Minister aware that uh, uh, the, the criminal courts are full of cases related to uh, joint enterprise? Is he aware of what is going on in terms of this terrible miscarriage? Could he promise me, and the team over there promised me, that they will meet with me and Jengba, the campaigning group, to see if we can clear the justice system of pe many people who should never be in the courts? Thank you, Mr Speaker. I, 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 the Honourable Gentleman has campaigned on this issue for some time, and I have met his colleague for Edmonton to discuss this very issue. Uh, the data collection does not support the identifying those criminal enterprises in the court system, but I understand that the Crown Prosecution Service are now doing exercise on better data collection to see if the issues that he continues to raise, quite rightly, uh, can be borne out by the data to see what actions we can take to address any injustices. Mr Alex Cunningham. Here, here. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. As the Honourable Member for Waveney pointed out, chaos on our courts continues, and now 500 security guards have voted for strike action after a pay offer worth just 38 pence above, an hour above the minimum wage. Peter Slater, Chairman of OCS, who employ them, says in his annual review, "This was an exceptional year where our colleagues went above and beyond to deliver reliable, high-quality services for our customers around the world in the most challenging circumstances. The reliability." and resilience of our frontline colleagues during the pandemic has been exceptional. I am sure the Minister will agree with me that the Government pays Mr Slater's company enough for him to deliver fair pay. Will he intervene to stop further chaos in our courts? Yes. Mr Speaker, I have to say that um, our courts are not in chaos, and I am sure uh, all colleagues work uh, well, I'm sure that if he actually takes time to talk to all partners across the criminal justice system, they will not bear that out. And I have to say that all elements of the criminal justice system, whatever role they play, have taken a big role in ensuring that the criminal justice system has continued to work smoothly. But in terms of the pay award, that is a matter for the private sector uh, employer. Uh, I will not intervene. Number six, Mr Speaker. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, I am pleased to say that uh, the inaugural meeting uh, of the Interministerial Group on Justice is taking place this afternoon, chaired by Lord Bellamy, and will be attended by the Scottish Government Cabinet Secretary for Justice, Angela Constance, MSP, and also the Council General for Wales, Mick Antonio, MS. This new forum that has been established by agreement between the four nations of the UK is to discuss justice issues of mutual interest. I thank the Minister for his answer. I rise as a convinced evolutionist. In fact, I think I am the only member of this place whose signature is on the claim of right for Scotland. As and when a new law is agreed in Edinburgh or Cardiff, say, what mechanism is in place to ensure that any such new law will not disrupt either England or other parts of the United Kingdom? Mr. Speaker, the Honourable Gentleman raises a very good point, and we've seen most recently when the, uh, the Scottish Government seek to uh, uh, railroad the rest of the UK on gender recognition. That is better when our legislatures work in tandem together for the benefit of all parties, not that we see Scotland trying to disrupt other parts of the United Kingdom by ill thought out legislation. 
Chris Stevens, SNP spokesperson. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, can, I, can I ask the Minister then? The, the Government will amend the Misuse of Drug Act uh, this afternoon, a 50 year old piece of legislation which uh, controls the shape of Scotland's criminal justice system to punish drug addiction with the full force of the law rather than treat users as addicts with health conditions in health settings. What conversations uh, can the Minister tell us he has had with Cabinet colleagues in the Scottish Government on helping introduce a safe drug consumption room pilot in Glasgow? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, that particular um, pilot, I'm not sure, is working that well based on recent reports. Uh, but I'll happily ask colleagues to look and see whether that pilot is working as the honourable gentleman has said, because that's not what the newspapers are reporting. But in terms of how um, the UK will re rest of the UK government will respond to it, that is something for the Interministerial Inter Inter Group, which can meet and is meeting this afternoon. Stevens. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm looking uh, confused by the Minister's uh, response there. Uh, currently, there is no pilot uh, in Glasgow um, uh, that, that, that's ongoing, but perhaps there's been some positive discussions between the Scottish Government and the Government here. So, does the Minister not concede, given that there are 100 drug consumption rooms in more than 60 cities across the world, which is supported by mountains of evidence from NGOs, civil society groups, and drug activists? alongside the Lord Advocate's new prosecution policy not to prosecute drug users for possession offences committed within a pilot safe or drugs consumption facility, can he give an ironclad commitment that the government will not block this life-saving health measure? Uh, Mr Speaker, the, the matter for how that legislation is dealt with is a, a matter for other colleagues, but I can reassure the gentleman that um, if uh, using uh, drug take as a health issue um, is working as he suggested in, then uh, we will learn from that and discuss it with our colleagues in the NHS. But the broad principle of it being a health issue is being dealt with by the NHS and the Health Secretary, and in terms of legislation, that is a matter for Cabinet colleagues. Lynn Brown. Number seven, Mr Speaker. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. We are building 20,000 modern prison places to help rehabilitate prisoners, cut crime and protect the public. And we continue to invest in prison maintenance so that existing places remain in use and safe. Lynn Brown. Well, the Minister is very um, interesting in that answer because, <laughs> let's face it, our prisons have been run That's down for 13 yeah, years. Many are so old. They were built before rack was even a twinkle in somebody's <laughs> bank account. And if you read the inspection reports, as I have, it's a list of woes. They're drafty, they're damp, they're infested, terribly overcrowded and woefully understaffed, hardly likely to enable rehabilitation. And it's our communities that endure the consequences, with at least 37 per cent of prison leavers reoffending within 18 months. It's simply not good enough, is it? Yeah. 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 Well, Mr Speaker, we continue to upgrade the uh, prison estate and, as I say, investing in 20,000 new places, the biggest expansion uh, in the secure estate since the, since the Victorian era. At the same time, we have been taking out some of our most uh, overcrowded and unsuitable prisons. Just last financial year, we took out 1,900 places and we're investing £168 million in custodial maintenance for 23, 24, and 24, 25. And she mentioned reoffending. Uh, I am pleased to say that there is no good level of reoffending but zero. But I am pleased to be able to report good progress on reoffending, which has been coming down as a result of more ex-offenders getting into employment, fewer of them being homeless, uh, and more being able to uh, get suitable good treatment uh, for addiction. Sir Robert Neill, Chair of the Committee. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, the Justice Committee is proposing to hold an inquiry into future prison population and estate capacity. And I look forward to the Minister uh, giving evidence to us about that. He will know that that is prompted in part by concerns that, that overall overcrowding in the adult estate, adult male estate, is some 23%, much worse in many of the old uh, local prisons, and that whilst he is right to uh, pay atten draw attention to the government's new prison building programme, even if that were all completed on time, there would, according to figures we have seen, uh, be a shortfall in March 2025 of uh, uh, about uh, 2,300 places as against anticipated demand. What is going to be done to deal with that? And 
Do we, should we have a proper conversation with the public about what is a reasonable expectation of what can be done in prisons and what is the best use of prisons and who should be there? Well, Mr Speaker, on, on my right honourable friend's last point, of course we must constantly be having uh, an intelligent, uh, constructive public debate about these matters. But look, on, on the question of capacity, we sh on projections, they, they change, of course, and there are many complex factors at play. I look forward, as ever, to joining his committee, to being scrutinised on that point. But specifically on crowding, I do think it's, it's important to note crowding, doubling up in cells, has for a very long time been a feature of our prison uh, system. And if you look at crowding overall, Mr Speaker, it is 2,000 fewer, 2,000 fewer uh, than it was uh, when we came into government in 2010. Mr Speaker. Um, thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, between... Uh, between January 2019 and December 2022, we removed uh, 13,851 foreign national offenders from the country. And as my honourable friend rightly uh, suggests in his question, that is all about close working with colleagues, close working with the Home Office. Luke Evans. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And we've all seen the stories of convicted foreign criminals being pulled off planes at the last minute. Now, with the Nationality and Borders Act, uh, was brought in to improve the process of returning criminals, speed up that process, increase the window for removal of foreign national offenders from prison under the early removal scheme. Could my right honourable friend comment on how this is working, how he expects this to affect the numbers, and how he expects the process to be sped up? Minister. Under the Nationality and Borders Act uh, 2022, as he mentions, we expanded the FNO early removal scheme window from nine uh, to 12 months, allowing for earlier removal, and we're working closely with the Home Office on that. In May, we also agreed a landmark new deal with Albania, and we're working to negotiate new prisoner transfer agreements with EU member states and other countries. Jim Shannon. Can I thank the, the Minister very much for that response? In, in Northern Ireland, it has been reported that the proportion of Northern Ireland's total jail population will heal, who hail from outside the United Kingdom and Ireland is disproportionately high. The figures indicate that there are some between 7 and 9 per cent per year. Has the Minister had a, a, an opportunity to assess that with the Department of Justice back home? Thanks so much. Um, Mr Speaker, of course, the, the way we are organised, we do not cover the prison service in Northern Ireland, as the Honourable as the Honourable Gentleman knows, but I, it is very important that we stay in close touch, and though I have not had that specific conversation recently with colleagues in Northern Ireland, no doubt there will be opportunities in the future. Matt Rodder. Number nine, Mr Speaker. Thank you, Mr uh, Speaker. The sale of Reading Prison is proceeding, and barring any unexpected complications, completion is expected uh, later this autumn. Yeah, Matt Rodder. Thank you, Mr Speaker. May I thank the Minister for his answer and also for meeting me um, and the Right Honourable Member for Reading West recently to discuss this. Reading Jail is a hugely important historic building. Now uh, nearly 13,000 people across Berkshire have signed a petition asking the Government to work with me and with the local arts community to turn the jail into an arts hub. Will he now reconsider the Government's approach? It has taken them a long time to discuss the proposed sale with their preferred bidder and no progress or slow progress appears to be being made. Will he now reconsider and will he work with me, Reading Borough Council and the local arts community to save this wonderful building? Well, Mr Speaker, the, the sale is, is progressing and any proposed development, of course, would be subject to approval from Reading Borough Council Planning Department. And of course, the usual due diligence requirements and so on will apply. Mr Speaker, we, we quite often throw around the, the term doughty campaigner in this chamber, uh, but I can certainly say that in respect of the honourable gentleman and my right honourable friend, his neighbour, the member for Reading West, they have indeed been incredibly assiduous uh, in their attention to this matter on behalf of their constituents, and in turn, I, I commit to him that we will absolutely stay in touch. Number 11, sir. Thank you, Mr Speaker. It is right that those convicted of a crime face up to its consequences by being in court when they are sentenced. On 30 August, the Lord Chancellor announced his intention to legislate as soon as parliamentary time allows on judges being able to order an offender to attend court for sentencing, making clear in legislation that reasonable force can be used to compel this, and that refusal to comply with a judge's order 
will cause the offender to face up to two years in custody. Thanks, sir. In 2014, Colin Ash Smith was convicted of murdering 16-year-old Claire Tiltman in my Dartford constituency. His final insult to her was to refuse to attend the sentencing hearing. So can I welcome the proposed changes to compel defendants to face up to the consequences of their actions? And can the Minister confirm, though, that there will be an opportunity for judges to hear representations from the prosecution, defence and security staff before such action is taken? Thank you, Mr Speaker. Well, I'm grateful to my um, honourable friend, and I hope he'll allow me this opportunity to express my sympathy to the friends and the family of Claire Tiltman, his constituent who was tragically murdered in 1993, or had lived in his constituency. I was glad to see her murderer brought to justice after so many years. Uh, Colin Ash-Smith, as with Lucy Letley, was cowardly for not attending the sentencing hearing to face up to his appalling crime. Each case is different, so it's important that the court and the judge have discretion in how to make an attendance order. Um, and in reaching that decision, although we're working through the details of this, we would expect the courts would consider the full circumstances of each individual case including any representations made by the prosecution or the defence in that context. Greg Thomas. Thank you, Mr Speaker. If we want offenders to attend their sentencing, it does rather help if the court is open. Harrow Crown Court was closed two and a half weeks ago because of the discovery of crumbling concrete rack, uh, <clears throat> with no indication as yet of any timescale for it to be uh, reopened. Its closure will inevitably exacerbate the backlog of criminal cases in the London area and prevent victims uh, of crime seeing justice. Could the Minister provide quickly an update on the progress of getting Harrow Crown Court modernised, fully repaired and open again? Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm grateful to the right honourable gentleman and particularly the dexterity with which he got, uh, he got Harrow Crown Court um, in. Um, he's right to highlight that case. I understand that remedial work is underway, that cases that were listed there have been transferred to other London courts to ensure they continue to still be heard. And I understand from my honourable friend that the indicative timescale to complete the works is six to nine months. Can I welcome the Shadow Minister Kevin Brown to say it will be quieter on the back benches and doubt he'll make it up on the front. <laughs> Kevin Brown. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I, I suspect the, the Minister might anticipate what I'm going to ask him, because I'm beginning to think the department should be renamed the Department for Justice delayed. But, um, you know, Labour proposed that we change the law on attendance sentencing back in 2022. Just last month, the Leader of the Opposition said that we were prepared to amend the relevant legislation if there was no action. So why is it taking so long for the government to intervene on behalf of victims and their families? Well, I'm grateful to the honourable gentleman, and may I take the opportunity to welcome him um, to his place. I suspect there will occasionally be to and fro's across this chamber, but I hope there will also be opportunities where we are in agreement to be able to work constructively um, together. We've been clear in our intention to bring forward appropriate legislation to reinforce the existing powers that the judiciary have in this respect, but it's important we get this right, and it's important that it builds in that degree of judicial discretion, because there may be some circumstances where victims would not wish to see the offender in court for sentencing because it would be deeply distressing or deeply disruptive. So it's important that we get this right. We are determined to do that, but we will work through the detail to make sure it is robust and effective. Greg Smith. Question 13, sir. Uh, Mr Speaker, we have recently seen indications of an improving national staffing picture uh, in prisons with an increase of 700 full-time equivalent band three to five prison officers and youth justice workers in the year to June 2023. Smith. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'm grateful to my rival friend for that answer, but the damning report into HMP Woodhill, just adjacent to my constituency, was clear that staff shortages were a huge factor in the serious issues that prison faces. It's equally well known that HMP Springhill and HMP Grendon in my constituency have faced recruitment challenges, and in that light, if we can't staff the prisons that we do have, surely it's unworkable to carry on with my right honourable friend's totally unwanted plans to build a new mega prison in my constituency and that that planning appeal should be withdrawn. Um, Mr Speaker, I, I am grateful to my honourable friend. He takes a very close interest in these matters, and rightly so, particularly on behalf of 
his constituents who are prison officers and other staff uh, in, 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 in and around his constituency. I can assure him we're working urgently to address the findings of the urgent notification at Wood Hill. I think we'll also come on to that perhaps a little later in questions with our honourable friends and the Lord Chancellor will as ever be publishing an action plan um, before the, by the end of the month. We also have active recruitment campaigns in place for Grendon and, and Spring Hill and are seeking to increase numbers by incentivised recruitment. Go on, Michael. Number 14. Thank you, Mr Bigger. I recognise uh, there continues to be work to, done, uh, to be done to improve conditions in some magistrates' courts for the users, and that's why we have boosted the capital investment programme to £220 million over the next two years to March 2025 to improve the quality and enhance the resilience of the court and tribunal estate, allowing us to plan major projects much more um, in advance and with certainty. The improvements will ensure that those on the front line of the justice system will benefit from buildings that are more access access sorry, accessible and sustainable. Thank you, Mr Speaker. We speak of access to justice, meaning the availability of legal advice and representation, but for too many older and disabled people, physical access to justice through the magistrates' courts in particular is well nigh impossible because the buildings themselves are not fit for purpose. Not fit for purpose actually was the term used to describe the magistrate courts in the Secretary of State's own constituency by the former Police and Crime Commissioner. Really, do we not need more swift action to remedy the problem than the Minister has already outlined? Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. In fact, I actually uh, took quite a bit of time to read the report from the Magistrates Association on inaccessible courts uh, to ensure that where we can take reasonable adjustments, we take them, uh, where we need to take more substantial issue investment uh, to make the courts more accessible, uh, particularly for uh, making it DDA compliant, that we do so and that those works are prioritised. But we are continuing to uh, work on new courts, as in Blackpool and in the City of London, to ensure that the estate is modernised and we have courts that are accessible and fit for purpose. So the point is well made and it is in hand. Hmm. Michael, Sir Michael Fabricant. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank yeah, you, yeah, Mr yeah, Speaker. Yeah. Question 15. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Um, to uh, preserve the independence of the judiciary, uh, the Lord Chief Justice has a statutory responsibility for the training of the judiciary under the Constitutional Reform Act of 2005. This includes magistrates and their legal advisers. The magistrates and legal advisers who support them in court must complete induction training before hearing cases, and once magistrates are sitting, continuation training is provided on regular cycles. Impartial decision-making is woven throughout all the material. Thank the minister for his answer. Chris Pincher and I, Chris Pincher and I, have been working very closely to ensure that the police act strongly and swiftly in Shenston near Litchfield, over constant demonstrations at an Israeli company which supplies arms to the British armed forces. Now, two people went to trial at a magistrate's court in Warsaw and they were acquitted. And it is reported, and we don't know for sure, because it's not a court of record, that the judge said, on the principle of proportionality, the action was proportionate in comparison to the crimes against humanity which they were acting to stop by the Israelis. Yeah. I mean, I think that, if it were true, is outrageous. What general, what can be done within the judicial system to ensure that this sort of thing doesn't happen, if indeed it did. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my honourable friend actually raises an important point in terms of the independence of the judiciary. We do have to be careful um, that we don't rely on reports by a third party, perhaps with a vested interest, because these cases are not reported officially. Uh, however, if uh, my honourable friend wishes to discuss uh, any points of law that may lead to an appeal, then the, uh, the prosecuting authority can do so, and I'm happy to uh, work with my honourable friend and guide him how that may be taken up with the Attorney General. But also, in terms of any complaints about the behaviour of the judiciary, there is a clearly defined process, which I'm very happy to discuss with uh, my honourable friend after today's session. Vision Village. Question number 16, Mr Speaker, sir. Um, thank you, Mr Speaker. At the 30th of June, there were just over 20,000 people working in the probation service, an increase of just over 2,300 or 13% compared to the 30th of June uh, the previous year. 
Mr. Fritz's answer. Two horrific cases of Jordan McSweeney and Damien Bendel show how vital it is to have effective supervision of recently released offenders. So can I ask the Minister what lessons have been learned from those two cases and will he provide an update on the action being taken to address problems in the probation service caused by high vacancy rates and consequentially unmanageably large caseloads for probation staff? Mr Speaker, I am very grateful to my uh, right hon. Friend. First, may I once again express uh, my sincere condolences to the families of Zara Alina, Terry Harris, Connie Ghent and John and Lacey uh, Bennett. Um, we have increased probation staff in, in the London area by 4.5% uh, over the last year, and that includes 270 trainee probation officers in post. The service has accepted all of the Chief, Exec Chief Inspector's recommendations in respect of the two appalling cases uh, that she mentioned and is implementing robust action plans, especially with regard to improving risk assessment. Question 17. Uh, Mr Speaker, Ministers engage regularly with uh, colleagues in the Welsh Government, uh, including uh, discussions on female offenders and alternatives to custody. Both governments work closely on delivering the uh, female offending women's justice blueprint for Wales. Short sentences for women often do more harm than good, reinforcing trauma and leading to further reoffending. In 2022, two thirds of sentences for immediate custody for women were for less than 12 months. And it's anticipated that there will be a thousand more women in prison by 2026. How does the Secretary of State justify the growing female pr prison population and use of short sentences with Wales's ambition to divert many women, as many as possible, away from prison? Well, well Mr. Trigger, women's population in prison has come, has come down. And sentencing is a matter for the judiciary and not, uh, not something that uh, government uh, in intervenes in. But it is very important that there are suitable alternatives to custody available. And I join with her in paying tribute to people running uh, women's centres, for example, which do a fantastic job specifically for women, as well as the, br the broader set uh, of alternative and community sentence options. And it's very, very important that we make sure we continue to work uh, on those, including together with the Welsh Government. We unfortunately come to Topitals Dem Neil Griffith. Question number one, Mr Speaker. Um, thank you, Mr Speaker. And I've been asked to reply on behalf of the Lord Chancellor, who has been in Riga attending a Council of Europe meeting where a political declaration was signed on support for the Ukrainian justice system. He is sorry, Mr Speaker, not to be here for these oral questions. He has asked me to convey to the House his thanks to the Metropolitan Police for their quick work in finding and returning Daniel Khalife to custody. The independent investigation he, com he commissioned must now get to the bottom of this serious breach. Since last orals, the Government has also announced that we will make whole life orders the expectation in sentencing where they can be applied. And we've also outlined plans to order the worst offenders to attend court for their sentencing hearings. We want to ensure that the worst offenders receive their sentences in the full glare of the courtroom and that victims have the opportunity to set out the impact the crime has had on them. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Well, with government spending for housing legal aid falling in the past decade from 44 million to 20 million and the spending for disrepair cases from nearly 4 million to just over 1 million, it's not a moment too soon that the government has begun to restore some legal aid with the Housing Loss Prevention Advice Service. But due to the government's disastrous Lapso Act, many housing legal aid providers shut up shop, leaving 42 per cent of the population of England and Wales without a single provider in their <coughs> local authority area, and 84 per cent with no access to welfare legal aid. So what recent analysis has the Minister made of legal aid uh, deserts, and what steps is he taking to remedy the situation? Thank you, Mr Speaker. Well, of course, we are putting more money into legal aid, including criminal uh, legal aid, following the independent review, and specifically on housing that she mentioned from the 1st of August, injecting an additional £10 million. Dame Andrea Lutz. Thank yeah. you, Mr yeah, Speaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I ask yeah. my right hon. Friend what conversations he's had across government to make sure that the sentencing for those convicted of dangerous cycling is equalised with the sentencing guidelines for those convicted of dangerous driving? Well, I'm grateful to my right hon. Friend, who I know takes a keen interest <coughs> in this issue. 
The safety of our roads is a key objective for the Government. Protecting all road users is a priority. Like all road users, cyclists have a duty to behave in a safe and responsible manner. While laws are in place for cyclists, the current laws are old and it can be difficult to successfully prosecute offences. That is why DFT colleagues are considering bringing forward legislation to introduce new offences concerning dangerous cycling to tackle those rare instances where victims have been killed or seriously injured by irresponsible cycling behaviour. Can I welcome the new Shadow Secretary of State, Shabana Mahmood? Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. I thank the Minister for the update about Daniel uh, Halif. But, Mr Speaker, the fact remains that HMP Wandsworth has been a known problem for the best part of a decade, with a litany of failures, including overcrowding, staffing and security issues. And Halif isn't even the first escape from Wandsworth. There was an incident in 2019, which the Chief Inspector of Prison said was a result of a serious security breach. Mm. Why, after so many warnings about Wandsworth, has the government Government fail to act. Well, Mr. Speaker, of course, we take these matters extremely seriously. The question she raised specifically about the 2019 uh, incident will be something, of course, that the uh, independent investigation will look at to make sure that lessons were learned. I do want to say that progress has been made uh, in Wandsworth, including if you look at the independent review of progress. Uh, from uh, His Majesty's Inspectorate, uh, and particularly on staffing, which I know has been a matter, rightly, of, of considerable public interest. There has been an increase some 25 per cent in staffing, specifically at Wandsworth, since 2017. Years of warnings, Mr Speaker, and years of inaction. I'm afraid that rather sums this government up. Hey. On Sunday, the Justice Secretary told us that 40 prisoners have been moved from Wandsworth, claiming that it was out of, and I quote, an abundance of caution. Can the Minister tell us how many other prisoners will have to be moved across the whole of the prison estate as a result of this escape? Because what the public want to see is not an abundance of caution after the fact of an escape, but an abundance of certainty that the prison estate is secure. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, it is. She would not expect me, I think, to get into a running commentary on transfer arrangements when we are talking about security. I do want to reassure her, this House and the public, that escapes from prisons are very rare, and they are much rarer now than they used to be. The number of, pe the number of escapes that have been from prisons in the last 13 years, since 2010, is considerably lower than it was in the 13 years before. Speaker, to encourage active travel, people need to feel confident using our roads, yet the courts can only impose the same penalties on multiple offenders as a first-timer. Will my right honourable friend consider the introduction of escalating penalties for repeat traffic offences? Thank you, Mr Speaker. My honourable friend is right to highlight the issue of traffic offences. As part of the Police Crime Sensing and Courts Act 2022, there was an increase in the minimum disqualification periods for the serious offences of causing death by careless driving when under the influence of drink or drugs from two to five years, and if there is a repeat offence within three years, it is increased from three to six years. The Department for Transport also is currently considering a broader call for evidence on motoring offences, and I hope that the very recent Cycling and Walking APPG report will be useful to them in this respect. I will ensure colleagues at the DFT are aware of her interest in this issue. Kenny McCaskill. As the substitute of careless offenders in low category prisons plays out, is it not time to free up space by removing Julian Assange from Belmarsh Maximum Security Facility, where he's languished since April 2019, guilty only of a minor bail breach when his real offence is exposing war crimes? But regardless of that, at his place of incarceration, Will the Minister ensure that he is actually able to attend proceedings in person, which he has been denied since January 2021, given all the comments about people being at court? Mr Speaker, I think the Honourable Gentleman has achieved his objective to get something on the record. I am not going to uh, comment on ongoing cases, but of course, uh, speaking more generally, access to justice is at the heart of what we do. I am Priti Patel. Speaker, I have a constituent who suffered life-changing injuries as a result of an assault eight years ago, and she is not on her own on that basis. She was only awarded £150 from a compensation order during the criminal case and offered £1,000 from the CICA. Will the Minister look at amending the Victims' Bill so that victims can be given the adequate care, compensation and support through the courts from offenders and, importantly, through the CICA? 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I'm grateful to my right honourable friend, who I know um, throughout her time in this House, particularly as Home Secretary, always has taken a very keen interest in supporting victims yeah. of crime. It is vital that victims get the compensation they're entitled to, be that from the offender or the criminal injuries compensation scheme, which paid out over £173 million in 2022 23. The making of a compensation order is a matter for the court, and there is no limit on the amount that a court can um, order an offender to pay. In respect of the criminal injuries compensation scheme, His Majesty's Government is currently consulting on changes following ICSA's report alongside previous consultations, so it's important this is able to be considered fully, but this will be post passage of the Victim and Prisoners Bill. One of my constituents tells me they're at risk of losing their home because of how long they've had to wait for a benefit decision appeal. Can the Minister outline what steps his department is taking to reduce the current 33-week waiting time for benefit, de benefit decision appeals to be heard? Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, across the whole uh, tribunal uh, process, the team will constantly monitor who are performing who aren't and sharing best practice. On a particular case, if the Honourable Lady would like to write to me with the details, I can investigate and see if there's any particular cause of delay. The Parliament passed a law in 2015 that offenders convicted of a second or subsequent knife offence should go to prison. Yet in the year to March, 1,600 such offenders, 37% of the total, <laughs> dodged a jail sentence altogether, the highest total since the new law was introduced. Will ministers ensure that the courts now hand down the sentences legislated for in this House eight years ago? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My honourable friend is right to highlight the scourge that is knife crime and the need for tough sentences for such crime. While sentencing in individual cases is a matter for uh, independent judiciary, who are able to consider the specific circumstances of individual cases in legislating on this issue, Parliament was clear about its seriousness. This is reflected in average sentences for all types of knife crime up from 6.5 months in 2010 to 8.1 months in 2020, and I would say that 87 per cent of those committing repeat offences were given a custodial sentence, including suspended sentences, which are a custodial sentence. Mr Speaker, I have a number of constituents whose um, asylum appeals have been allowed uh, by the Courts and Tribunal Service, who are then thrust into limbo between the case going back to the Home Office to approve things. What conversations have Ministers had with their Home Office colleagues, including this backlog that is preventing my constituents from getting on with their lives? Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'm always happy to look at individual cases to see if there are specific issues why there's a delay, but broadly speaking, I work with colleagues at the Home Office uh, and in the uh, Solicitor General Office to see what we can do to ensure that any delays in the process are smoothed out so that people don't have to wait for their day in court. Joel Murray. Thank you, Mr Speaker. What review, if any, has the Department carried out to ensure that when the courts extend bail, that they are ensuring that the police are dealing with their investigations di diligently and expeditiously. Uh, my honourable friend raises obviously a point that is uh, of importance to her constituents, but I must stress that the independence of the judiciary is fundamental to the rule of law and to the running of the justice system. And therefore, the department hasn't and won't be conducting review in how the judiciary undertake their functions in individual cases, but I can reassure her that the judiciary do ensure uh, that the uh, relevant agencies that they work with undertake their functions smoothly and effectively. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Is it not the case, Minister, that last-minute cancellations in magistrates' courts are largely caused by the inability to recruit and retain legal advisers who appeared a lot less than what other government legal advisers appeared? What steps will the Minister take to ensure that there is an increase in wages, terms and conditions for these legal advisers, and will he sit down with the PCS Union to try and resolve this intolerable situation? Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we look carefully at why all cases are vacated. In actual fact, the, the biggest cause of vacation will often be the non availability of prosecution counsel or defence counsel, not a non availability of legal executives. Peter Bottomley. Can I put to ministers that a nine month wait for granting simple probate is unfair on people who are trying to sell a parent's home? I failed to get the government and the probate service to work. My consistent argument to the Prime Minister, will Ministers please sort it out? 
Mr. Speaker, uh, in fact, the time taken between uh, when the documents, all documents required, are received is between six and nine weeks. We always advise that no one should take a decision on the sale of property until probate is granted, but I can reassure my honourable friend that despite a significant increase in applications, uh, the service is recruiting and training up over 100 new case workers to ensure that the service does deliver the service that he wants and that I also want. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last month, the United Nations called for an urgent government review of IPP sentences. Will the Secretary of State listen to the UN, and can he explain why the number of people on an IPP sentence recalled to prison without committing any further offence has soared in recent years? Uh, Mr. Speaker, I can confirm that the Lord Chancellor and I, and, and us all, are very consciously aware of the issues of the difficulties around the IPP sentence, a sentence that would not be introduced today. We did abolish it, as she will uh, know, but there are people uh, in prison who have been recalled or have not been released by the parole board because they've not been considered safe for release. Our objective is to help to manage people towards safe release into the community, and to that end, our recently announced action plan is central. Mark Eastwood. Uh, rehabilitation of offenders is so important in reducing the chances of committing crime once released from prison, especially if they can get back into work. Could the Minister outline any schemes that helps give offenders the skills they need and how they can access companies that are willing to give them a second chance in life? My honourable friend is so right, and in topical questions, I haven't time to start to unpack all the different things I would like to say, so I won't. Suffice to say, brilliant companies providing training opportunities. Oh, and others! Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I've written to the Secretary of State about the tragic case of my young constituent, Greg Maguire, and um, he has agreed to meet with me, and I'm very grateful. But can I ask the Minister, does his department have any plans to reassess? the current rules, which means that victims' families are unable to appeal sentences for those convicted of causing death by careless driving. Well, I'm grateful to the Honourable Lady. Um, I know she's meeting the Secretary of State to discuss this. I don't want to preempt that meeting. If she wishes, I'm very happy to join that meeting with her or even to meet her separately to talk about this if she feels that would be helpful to her. Jim Walton. It is almost six months since I finally secured a meeting with the Justice Minister and the Health Minister uh, after six cancellations about what had happened to Section 4 of my civil partnerships bill empowering coroners to investigate stillbirths. I was assured that this law, passed by this House in February of 2019 with a consultation which closed in June 2019, would imminently be published and progress would be made. Nothing has happened. Is it ever going to happen? Yes, it will, and both uh, the Health Minister and I are pushing this as fast as we possibly can. Rick Mr Speaker, the scale of the illegal drugs problem in prisons was such that five years ago the government introduced a programme that cost £100 million. Has the, programme got, has the problem got worse or improved in the time since? Mr Speaker, I think we, we, well, we, def we are seeing progress. It's a combined approach of having the drug recovery wings, the incentivised, subsidised free living, but also making sure that security to stop drugs getting into prisons. There are things like X-ray uh, body scanners, which we've deployed in many prisons. Rob Butler. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it is perhaps unfortunate that many members of the public and much of the media only take an interest in prisons when there is an escape, but that is something that is thankfully very rare. Would my right hon. Friend join me in hoping to see now a calm and measured public debate about the role of prisons, not least working out ways to improve rehabilitation, which ultimately protects the public? Yeah, yeah. Um, Mr Speaker, he is of course exactly right, and my honourable friend has a long history in this since, since before uh, reaching this House. It is ultimately all about rehabilitation, reducing reoffending and helping to keep the public safe. Joanna Chari. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Over 10,000 women have signed a public letter to the Prime Minister asking him to take action against the escalating campaign of threats and intimidation against women who stand up for women's rights. And many of these women are particularly concerned that the institutions supposed to protect them are failing to do so, and that includes the criminal justice system. Would the Minister for Victims uh, be good enough to meet with me and representatives of those who have organised the letter to discuss this important issue? I'm, I'm always happy to meet with the Honourable and Learned Lady. Robert Neil. Thank you, Mr Speaker. 
The reputation of our justice system depends upon the independence and integrity and professionalism of our judges. At the end of this month, the Right Honourable Lord Burnett of Morden retires as Lord Chief Justice to be succeeded by Dame Susan Carr, the first ever female Chief Justice. Will he place on record in, on, in this House his appreciation and all of our appreciation to Lord Burnett for the exceptional leadership he has shown to the judiciary throughout his term in office? Well, I'm grateful to, the, uh, to my honourable friend. I know the uh, Lord Chief Justice, and I am very happy on behalf of His Majesty's Government and all those on the front bench to do exactly as he said, pay tribute to his exemplary period as Lord Chief Justice. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I would like to pay tribute to campaigners who have challenged joint enterprise and, as a result, the CPS have now committed to monitor who are prosecuted. And I welcome the report um, at the end of this month. But can the Minister commit to an audit of all joint enterprise convictions, particularly as more black people are disproportionately impacted by this conviction? Yeah, yeah. Very good. Mr. I, I can commit to a wait until we've seen what the work being done by the CPS uncovers, and then once we have data, then we can have a rational discussion as to the next steps. Very clearly for a final question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Is the Minister aware of the prevalence of the um, unfounded and unscientific concept of parental alienation within our family courts? This is causing suffering and, in some cases, violence against women and girls. So, what steps has their department taken to ensure that the courts recognise the harm of this discredited concept of parental alienation? Mm -hmm. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, the uh, Department is well aware of the concerns and that is why it is currently uh, under review and the actual results of that review, including publication of all the data and research behind the outcomes, will be published later this year. Thank you for your right, that's complete questions.